Today we're going to talk about team-based learning, and um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer that um, nobody can learn how to do team-based learning in one hour. So this is just a short introduction to it, and hopefully um, this will intrigue you enough that you might want to come to the um, ADAPT workshop, where we're actually going to do a team-based learning workshop. So. Um, and the other thing I'm going to say is, please, if you have questions while I'm talking, don't leave them till the end. I'm fine to be interrupted at any given time. So you can either put your hand up or put something in the chat and Amy's going to keep an eye on it because um, my rusty Zoom skills are not going to allow me to pay attention to both at the same time. So, yeah, or just interrupt at any time. I'm happy for you to do that. So I guess what I'll start off with is why do I do team-based learning? And I do team-based learning in a large science class. I do it in my human physiology class. And my class has anywhere from about 240 to 288 students um, in the fall and spring semester. And uh, around 96 is what it's capped at for summer sessions. So that's a small class for me. Uh, but the reason I decided to do team-based learning was um, it started with course evaluations and students would always complain that it was too much content too quickly. And then the second thing that sort of inspired me was a work was a series of workshops given by Ian Beatty and Bill Gerace in physics on problem based learning. And I thought, oh my gosh, problem based learning with some of the content that they can just kind of learn themselves on Canvas is the way to go for this class. So I, with the support of um, getting training through the physics department who are very uh, adept at these types of learning, I jumped into a problem-based learning semester and it really didn't go well. And the major problem was students were not prepared for class. They didn't do the studying ahead of time that they needed to do. So um, around that time, I ended up going to a couple of workshops on team-based learning, one by um, Larry Michelson and um, the other one by Ann Braceby. And it was life-changing. After going through these workshops, I'm like, oh my God, this is the solution. And um, I haven't looked back since. So um, I guess one thing I wanna start with is, have any of you done team-based learning or what problems are you trying to solve or what are you thinking about at the beginning of this and hoping to get out of it? And um, I guess uh, I'll start with Deanne since you were here first. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I, I love the concept of team-based learning. I try to incorporate it. I'm always um, looking for more strategies to make sure that every single student is engaged and getting what they need out of it from a learning standpoint. And if I listen to student comments, right, is that there's always that fear that one person is going to have to carry the load in the team. So I've tried some things about, um, you know, outlining different roles that happen in groups, right? And, 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 and not assigning, but having students think about and talk about what role each person is gonna, going to assume. But I'm just looking for, for that, figuring out how to make team-based learning work for every single student. Okay, Lori. I have a very similar concern as Deanne. Whenever I try and do team-based learning, it seems like there's only one or two people who do the bulk of the work, and then the rest of them just kind of sit back on their coattails. Okay. We're trying to figure out how to get them all engaged and keep them all engaged so that the workload's equitable. Okay, Diane. Uh Hi, everyone. Uh, mine is the same. Okay. It's, it's the um, unequitable engagement. Okay, great. All right. Well, hopefully I can address some of that um, as we're working through this. So 
Uh, let me jump right into sort of a description of this. So one thing with team-based learning, if you're doing it sort of in the strict sense, it's not the same as I do group work sometimes in my classes. So it actually has um, quite a, oops, went too far, sort of a formalized structure to it. So there's a, um, Larry Michelson is sort of, I guess you could call him the father of team-based learning. And he's got a similar graphic, but um, I find this one um, a little bit cleaner. Amy, are we gonna be providing this PowerPoint to people? Cause it has a couple of links in it, if they want it. I can do that, yes. Okay. I guess I can share the link to the Google uh, slides later with you. Well, you have the link to it, I think. Maybe not. All right. So basically, there's sort of three overall phases to a formalized team-based learning class. And the first is where students prepare for class. And that's where they do pre-class individual study. And I provide materials for them on Canvas. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about that. So that's a really, really key part. Because when I did problem-based learning in groups initially, and it wasn't sort of formalized, they did not come prepared. And that was a huge problem. Then the next phase is um, what's called the readiness assurance phase. And so it starts with a readiness assurance test. So actually, let me back up just a little bit. So these three phases would really um, happen with every unit of your course. So your unit may be, your course may have um, three or four units that this would be appropriate for, or I have actually nine in my class. So this, this sort of process of phase one, two, and three can happen three or four times, or it could happen more times than that. It really just depends on what you're teaching and your, your course structure. So they're provided with content that they're going to learn and, and and the whole metacognition piece is really important in explaining to students why you need to be prepared. And so they take um, an individual test and then a team test, which is exactly the same test, but they take it um, on scratch off cards and they argue about their answer choices. And this is where the preparation is so important. I tell students, even though these parts aren't worth as much as a large summative test, this is where they figure out where they have misconceptions and where they thought they understood something, but if they can't explain it to somebody else, then maybe they don't understand it as well as they thought they did. And then there's um, follow-up discussion on that. Kind of depends how it goes. So there may be some question that everybody's stuck on or you realize, wow, they really don't get this and, and you might spend more time on, on one thing other um, compared to another thing. And then in phase three, it's sort of follow-up activities. And this um, could involve any number of classes, depending again on your subject and um, how, your, how your class is structured, where you have team activities that happen during class. And I'll talk a little bit more about structure of team activities, because that's quite important. Um, team discussion, and you might intersperse um, periods of lecture in, in this part here. So does anybody have any questions so far? I'm going to give you examples of what will happen during these different phases from my class. Okay, so for example, session one. So prior to the start of the class then, um, so this is, I'm kind of going into phase one and phase two here. So students are studying, I provide them with a set of specific learning objectives with content attached to them. And I do it on Canvas, so um, probably most of us do. Then I do a 10 question multiple choice quiz. Again, depending on how your course is organized, if you, you may, give more or fewer questions. And um, in a face-to-face -face class, so I'm just gonna talk about how I do this in a face-to-face -face class for now. I've obviously adapted it for online when necessary, but um, I'll, I'll focus on how it works face-to-face. -face. So they do it on paper and they turn it in 
And then they immediately do the same test right afterwards um, on scratch off cards. So I have another copy of the test in their folder. I use folders to distribute material to the teams. And then they take however long it takes. And it might take, it could take 30 minutes or more for them to work on this team test. And so they decide on the answer together. It's a group decision and they scratch it off. And the more, the fewer times they have to scratch for the answer, the more points they get. So you can see this was a team that got 100% on their first one. I put two tests on each card because they're 25 item cards, but you can see they got the right answer the first time every time here. But on this one, this must have been a slightly harder test because they took two tries to get the answer here. They took three tries to get the answer here and two tries there. So. I'm going to show you a little um, a short video and I hope it comes up in the right place of students doing a team test in my class. And can you guys see the video? Okay, perfect. <laughs> So what did you guys notice about that? What are your initial impressions? Lots of activity and talking and engagement. Looked like a fun class to be in. <laughs> it's loud, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so then after they finish with that, um, then we do a wrap up depending on how it went. So again, sometimes like if it's a really hard test or if I, if I write a question where um, maybe I haven't, maybe I've given choices where like it's hard to distinguish between two choices because I've kind of screwed up writing the question, then that becomes an opportunity for, you know, discussing, okay, well, why, why could you reasonably choose both of these answers? And yes, I will give you all the points back <laughs> when it comes to grading it. But um, so it's sort of like you guys may have heard the term agile teaching and you know you kind of have to be prepared to switch directions sometimes based on how this goes. All right, so that's sort of the first day of each module where we do this readiness assurance process and a lot of misconceptions get cleared up here or revealed that need to be worked on to get cleared up. So then in the next class, um, and usually my modules are about four classes long, but again, it can vary depending on your class structure. So then usually there's a small amount of lecture to either discuss something difficult from the previous class or to introduce a new topic or to introduce um, a team assignment. So they'll do a team assignment that they do during class in their teams and they turn it in. And then um, there's usually some wrap up based on how the team assignment went. Because again, these team assignments, when they're doing this teamwork, we're listening to them talking and explaining. And, and, um, and this is where I figure out what they're confused about. And I can follow up and change direction depending on how these things go. 
So then the next session might be um, some lecture interspersed with clicker questions. So we use, I use student response systems. I actually use iClicker. Um, maybe another team assignment, maybe a discussion problem. And so subsequent classes can follow in a similar pattern. So, um, and some modules have more sessions than others, and um, but typically every class has something active to do. It may not be a full-blown team assignment that takes 10 or 15 minutes. It might just be clicker questions or discussion questions. So um, what I wanted to do was put you guys in a breakout room so you can talk without me hearing. <laughs> and. Um, and really, I want to hear like your usually when I first was exposed to this, I'm like, oh, my God, that's never going to work initially until I actually went through the whole workshop and then I was on board. But I guess what I want to know is like, what would be your objections to this? What would be difficult or impossible for you to implement in your class? And then um, we can come back and talk about that. So. Oh my gosh, Amy, I forgot how to do breakout rooms. Do that for you, feel me too? Okay. But I so think you put everybody in one, I think. Okay. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So what did you guys come up with? And don't hold back. Be be critical if you have concerns. We talked to the challenge of timing. Um, in a 45 minute class, how do we um, manage a 30 minute space of, of time for them on the test? Okay. So basically fitting everything in that you need to fit in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We also talked about um, the scoring of it. So how, how do we keep track of individual student scores, and then also the team scores when each one is scored a little bit differently based on how many times it takes for them to get to the correct answer. It just seems hey. like a lot of tracking. Yeah, it is. And and there's um, there are a lot of nuts and bolts, like there's some practical organizational things that are really important to take care of. But once you get a procedure down, it's actually pretty easy. But I can. Um, yeah, I'll address that um, scoring, tracking, kind of the admin stuff to keep up with. Yeah, I can talk about that. And then we talked about how do you keep them on task so they don't wander off to who won the game last night and <laughs> what am I doing this weekend? Yeah. Okay. I will address that. Um, I'm just I'm I'm making notes so that I can address your questions when we get to those particular topics because. Uh, these are great questions. Okay, well, let's jump into some of the, um, and like I said, this is a real overview. When we do the workshop at ADAPT, um, we'll get really more into the nuts and bolts of how to do it. And um, it's not something you can say, okay, I can manage this after, well, I couldn't do it after one workshop. Um, I, I needed a lot more help and guidance to, to deal with it, so. There was one more question, Elizabeth, oh. in the chat, and that is, where did you get the scratch off card? So can you address that oh. as well? Yeah, I have. Um, so in the materials that are linked in ADAPT, actually, I've got the um, the link to the company where I get them from. And I will. Um, so you're going to send the PowerPoint after, right? I will um, I will link in where to get them in that PowerPoint. So I'll link the scratch off card information. We also had a question about how you do it in asynchronous classes. Asynchronous. I have not done it asynchronously. I've done it synchronously on Zoom um, and, and I use breakout groups. So, but I've never done it asynchronously. I've taught labs asynchronously where students work in groups, but 
that's something I haven't thought through in asynchronous class. So that's an interesting question. Was there anything else before we jump into information? Okay. So, um, so there's Larry Michelson um, lists four elements that are really important and that have to be executed well for team-based learning to be effective because it can go really badly or it can go really well. So the first one is groups and they have to be chosen carefully, um, not randomly assigned, um, size matters and it works better when you have permanent groups. And there's arguments for and against that, but um, what I've found is permanent groups work better. So teams have to be as diverse as possible based on a factor that matters for your course. So racial ethnic diversity, I don't even have to make an effort for my class. I, and I think all of us probably have a similar situation. That diversity is just there. But what where I do need to make sure my teams are diverse is I actually set them up to diversify them by class and major. So I have everywhere from freshmen to postbacs in my class. So that would not be a um, factor that would matter if your class is all freshmen, right? You would not that wouldn't be an issue, but, um, and I've got all different majors in my class. So I've got freshmen to postbacs, I've got pre-nursing, I've got biology majors, kinesiology, um, biochem, therapeutic rec. I mean, I've got nutrition, I've got a variety of different majors. So I diversify my teams that way. So all the freshmen are spread out, all the seniors are spread out, all the nurses are spread out so that every team has um, upperclassmen and freshmen and, and a variety of majors in every team. And when students say, oh, I want to be on a team with my roommate, I say no, and I tell them why. And because what happens is sort of little clicks form and like pairs will work together and exclude the other team members. So, and once I explained, I've never had anybody be upset about that after I explained it to them. So that's important. So whatever matters for your class, set your teams up to diversify them by that particular factor. Some people use a pretest um, based on content. So you're spreading out strong with less prepared students. The other thing is team size, and that's really important as well. They need to be big enough so you've got enough collective intellectual resources in order to um, be effective, but if you make them too big, then they tend to split into two factions. So I found five to six works really well, and I go for six because to try to account for drops. This semester has been problematic because I had a lot of drops this semester, and this has not been the greatest semester for student engagement and participation. And I think this is something that's university wide, nationwide from people I've talked to. So some of my teams are a little bit smaller than I would like them to be this semester. And usually I would amalgamate them if you know enough people have dropped that a team is too small. But I didn't this semester because I didn't want to squish people together in the room any more than I had to just because of COVID concerns. But um, hopefully moving forward, we can get back to more normal people distribution. Then the other thing is I keep my teams permanent. So what happens is they develop usually really good working relationships with each other. And early on, I would halfway through the semester say, should I rearrange the teams? Would you guys like to reorganize and have new teams? And overwhelmingly, they said no, they wanted to stay in their own teams. Usually at this point, someone asked me, well, what if teams don't get along? And I would say, I can't remember. I've been doing this since 2000 and 12, maybe 2014, and I've only had two team divorces. So um, it rarely happens. Usually we can work out the issues. So questions about teams. So when I do set up the teams, and I know Deanne, you were asking about um, scoring and tracking. I set up a folder. Hold on, I'm gonna scoot back and grab a folder.
So I have a pocket folder for every team. And I know that's backwards. It says team 44. Um, and then within the folder, I have um, a roll sheet. So their names are on there and they check off their attendance when they come to class each day. And um, this is an example of a team assignment they did. We worked on the kidneys and um, they just mark if they're there or not. And um, so they get credit for the teamwork if there's a check mark there. And so I put their team number in Canvas as a item in the grade book worth zero points. So I can sort my Canvas roster by team. And then I just go down and enter the grades. And it's actually really fast. So, um, and for the, the grades on the scratch off cards, it's always out of 40 and they, they do the adding up. So on a scratch off card, let me grab one that has grades on it so I can hold up. So they actually, um, I can hold this up. So they put the number here and they add it up. So if they got 40, then in my grade book, it's out of five. And I just put a five for each member of the team that was there. So um, if it's out of 34, I've got a sticky note on my shelf that says, okay, 34 points is 4.3 out of five. So, and, and so it actually doesn't take very long to enter the grades at all. So because I sort my grade book by team, but you have to put that in as a um, Canvas link. And I have an Excel spreadsheet where I set up the teams to begin with. So I get our admin assistant to give me my roster by class and major, then I sort it and I put their team number in and then I can just upload that to Canvas. So it's actually really fast to do that. Um, but the team, the folders, the students pick up their folders, they get their work returned in them and their work delivered in them. This is really the key to the organization. And do they ever lie about who was there? Occasionally, but um, usually if it's an egregious um, uh, violation of academic integrity, they get routed out. So I, I don't think it's a really serious problem. Any other questions about setting up teams? Okay. Then um, feedback. So this is critically important um, for students to be comfortable. So it has to be timely and frequent. So the the um, readiness assurance process is really a, a type of formative assessment. The team assignments are formative assessment, the clicker points, and they develop the confidence in their ability to work through the problems because I teach this as a flipped class, obviously, because you, you, there's very little lecture or much less lecture. So most of the content is online. So they need this frequent feedback so they know that they are achieving the learning objectives. Because um, without the feedback, then they, they really don't know if they're getting or learning what they're supposed to be learning. So I always make a point to discuss anything um, problematic in the team test right away afterwards or on the team assignments afterwards. And with the timing, so that actually can become problematic. So sort of with experience, you learn what you can cover in your class. And I now set a strict time limit on the team assignments because, and they're graded. They're not, the teamwork's not worth a ton of their grade, but it's worth enough that they care about it. Um, but I set a strict time limit and sometimes I even put a timer on the screen so it counts down and they know how much time they have because, Otherwise, like you were saying, Lori, they're talking about the basketball game or whatever else they are talking about um, or or scrolling on their phones. That's probably the worst bane of my life right now is their distraction with um, stuff on their devices. But when you put that timer up and they know they have to get to it, they just get to work and they get it done. It's like it was like magic. It was my learning assistants that actually came up with that idea. And they were brilliant. 
Um, so I also have some undergraduate learning assistants that take our science pedagogy class, so they get course credit for that, which helps with getting around to answering all the questions that they have during teamwork. And an SI leader that helps with that too. So the feedback is really important for them to know where they stand. Then accountability. So this is huge. If there's no accountability, I don't know about your students, but mine will not do anything if there's no grade attached to it. They won't prepare, they won't study. So the um, there's two forms of accountability that are really important. So one of them is the readiness assurance process. It influences their grades, so they care. Um, and so the, the good students really prepare hard for that. The other part is peer evaluation. And I always do peer evaluation two to three times a semester. I actually do it on a Google form. It's, it's a little bit time consuming and I would love to find a better way to do it. But um, that way I have them give them, so they have a participation grade that this is built into and they, give each other a grade out of 20. And then they have to put something they appreciate about their team members and something that their team members could do better. This actually really makes a difference because they care more about what their peers think about them than what I think about them. And um, what I've noticed is, um, and I do return the the feedback anonymously. They'll say things like, oh, you're so smart, I wish you would speak up more, or I wish you'd get to class on time, or I wish you'd show up at class more often. But it's usually, even the negative feedback is couched in a positive way. They're, they're really very kind to each other. And then in the second feedback, what I notice is they'll, they'll say, wow, you're doing so much better at this. And I really appreciate that you're speaking up more. So I think that really, really makes a difference. And I didn't do it the, last, the semesters online because I didn't think it, it would be effective. And I didn't do it this semester because I was worried we'd have too many um, students out being under quarantine. And I wish I had because um, they've been there and I think not having that peer evaluation has made them care a little bit less. So I think that peer evaluation is really, really important and it has to contribute to their grade a little bit because that actually matters to them. Questions about that part. And that helps with the free riders a little bit in terms of students sitting and doing nothing because they'll, students will say, um, you need to help us out more. And, uh, and they often do it in such a way that um, they tell their team members that they value them and they want them to contribute. And then there are some that will never participate no matter what you or their team members say. And we can't save them all. <laughs> then the fourth one, so these are the four that um, are sort of the, the ones that Larry Michelson, the father of team-based learning says are critical and he's right and assignment design. And I learned a lot about this. I have to credit Ian Beatty and Bill Gerace on the problem-based learning workshops they've given in the past. They are masters of this. So the assignments need to be engaging and relevant and they have to involve a group decision because you know we give them lab reports or term papers or big group things where they say you do this you do this and you do this and that's not really teamwork it's like farming it out so you don't want to give them something that they farm a piece out of it to each group member it has to be something they decide on together so that's really important so the elements of assignments so it should be a group decision so they don't divide up the task. They all have to have input into deciding what's the answer, what's the solution to the case study or whatever the assignment happens to be. And if it provokes some kind of emotional response or has a moral dilemma to it, they care more about it. Um, you have to be a little bit careful about that. I've actually caused an uproar in the last couple of years with assignments that have always worked well in the past, but have just triggered people more recently. So um, 
You don't want to provoke too much of an emotional response, but it has to be something they care about. Or like, I'll give you an example, one that um, promotes a lot of arguments. So one of the ideas when I do digestion is that um, proteins, when you eat them, you digest them into amino acids and you absorb them as amino acids, which is why insulin, which is a protein, has to be injected into your blood because if you ate it, you digest it and it wouldn't do anything. So I could give them this problem with insulin and say, um, why does insulin have to be injected and have them work it out based on how proteins are digested and absorbed? But that's boring. So what I do is I ask them about bovine somatotropin, which is the bovine growth hormone that's um, fragments of it are in milk. And so, um, and, and so it's kind of an issue in the news sometimes. And I say, is it safe to consume bovine somatotropin? And I say, you know, it's a protein-based hormone from the anterior pituitary. But when people hear, oh, there's hormones in the milk, they must be dangerous, right? So, um, and so they have to decide, is it dangerous to consume or not and why? And um, basically the answer is, it's perfectly safe to consume because you drink the milk, you digest the protein into amino acids and you absorb it as amino acids. And some of them still want to say at the end, it's dangerous because it's a hormone. So they, um, but they actually care about solving the problem because they have opinions about whether there should be hormones in the milk or not. So, but it's the same thing as why is insulin injected, but it's, that's not as, compelling a story as a growth hormone in the milk. Questions about that part? Okay, so then, and actually I, I should say that designing these assignments is challenging, but it's really fun too. So I actually really enjoy that part of it. I had, I've added another one, which is um, what I have learned is that because my class is flipped and the content is mainly online and we work with the problematic concepts in class where they have to apply what they've learned online, you have to provide them with really clear learning objectives and really excellent materials to learn from. And so this is um, so a screenshot from my Canvas page where what I've learned, and actually I have better alignment with my specific learning objectives and content after taking online learning level two, maybe? Yep, two. So I know, Deanne, you took that one too, right? So yeah, if you haven't taken that, it's, it is applicable even to non-online classes because there's just so much awesome stuff in there. So anyway, so what I have is um, I have a page where I have a big table. This is the last unit of the course. So this is the stuff, oh, you need to make sure you know this from previous units. And then I've got overarching goals and then specific learning outcomes that are, all of this stuff here would be in these documents. So it's very clearly aligned and I've tried to chunk it into smaller pieces so they can plan out their um, studies. And, there are students that, despite the fact I do a welcome video that link, leads them through Canvas, and I go through this on the first day of classes, there are students halfway through the class, is there a study guide for this course? How do I know what to study? And you can just point this out to them if you've got it clearly marked. So the, the SLOs form their study guide, and um, and they've got things in the form of PDF files, videos and also interactive PowerPoints. And um, do you guys want to see what an interactive PowerPoint is? So it's a way of getting them to act. I hope this will work. Yes. So um, I they have to look at these in slideshow mode. Can you guys see it? Reproductive development. This one is yeah. has less interactions than some of the other ones, but I wanted it to match with um, the module, if it matters. Anyway, so it's really the same content that's in some of the other material, but it's a way of them moving through it in a more active way. So for example, um, 
this is basic review from general biology, but what offspring, you know, why do we have a 50-50 sex ratio? And so they should, you know, if they're being active, they'll jot down this pundit square and say, oh, X and X and X and X and X and Y. And then the answer is on the next page. And then um, they this links to a video that takes them through this whole flow chart of embryonic development. And you know how we need alt text for images that we have online? Well, this is the alt text for that image there. So a <laughs> text description of the flow chart. But then it leads to questions. So how do steroid hormones enter cells? So they've got to click on the right response. So if they pick on the wrong answer, it takes them to a page where it reminds them what primary active transport is. So they try again. Oh, well, let's try facilitated diffusion. Nope, that's not the answer. And then they pick the right answer and it tells them they're right and why, and then they move on to another question. So it's a way of giving them some active way of moving through the content. So for example, if they get this one wrong, it tells them to try again and then, oh yeah, that's the right answer. And then they can go on to the next thing. And this is an application question here based on that chart. So it's a way of having them not just sort of read it over, but actually stimulate thinking about the material. And I actually had a student that, and I have usually one or two for every unit, and a student this semester said, can we have more interactive PowerPoints? I really like them. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll work on those. But they, they take a while to make, but they're really fun to make if you like doing this kind of thing. So let me escape out of that. Uh, so, oh wait, how do I get back to, um, oh, I'm in the right place. So then the last thing is evidence that team-based learning works. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is this figure here from, it was from a paper about measuring brain activity with sensors, and it really wasn't a teaching paper, but it was about, oh, how do we, and, but they were testing it on students doing different things. So the time of day is on the x-axis, and then the different days on the y-axis, and you can see they were in lab or watching TV or sleeping, taking an exam, sitting in a lecture class, doing their homework, Notice what their brains are doing sitting in a lecture. Nothing, not very much. Now, maybe if they were watching TikTok videos like they do during my lecturing, maybe their brains would be doing more. I don't know. But then look what they're. So one of my students several years ago, I always show them this and he put his hand up and he said, Dr. Tomlin, I think what these data show is that we should be sleeping during class. <laughs> Anyway, so when they're doing active things like homework, which is applying content, right, then they're busy doing stuff. So lecturing at them is really not effective. And again, it's, they will rebel against teaching themselves. And so it's really important to keep reminding them about how they learn. And so they're thinking about how they're learning. But what I have found is my class attendance is excellent. This semester has been anomalous, but um, it, in, in previous semesters that I've done this, attendance has been excellent. Students say they feel a better, a greater sense of belonging in a large class. And in fact, when we were online, I've had more than one student say this was the only online class I had where I actually felt connected to the class because we worked in groups and we did stuff and talked to each other. I have, um, so comparing grades is like apples and oranges. If you give, you know, nine tests in a final exam or whatever, it's not the same as incorporating group work into it. But I do give a cumulative final exam that's very similar every semester. Not exactly the same, but similar. Um, and I went up 10% on that cumulative final exam when I switched to team-based learning. So, um, and that was definitely consistent across the semesters. I also got off the DWF list. I was on that for years. And then once I switched to team-based learning, I was off. I might be back on this semester, but again, this semester is anomalous. Um, 
And both high and low achieving students benefit from this because the lower achieving students get the benefit of having peers explain things to them. And the higher achieving students, when the, we all know when you have to teach things to other people, you have to know it better, right? And you find the edges of what you know. And I don't know how many times I've had something run through my brain and seem perfectly fine. And then the words come out of my mouth and I'm like, wait, no, I'm wrong about something there. So, so both levels, all levels of students benefit from explaining things to each other, which is the whole basis of our SI model. And it's, it is very effective. The other thing is improved teaching, because when you listen to students explaining things to each other when you're overhearing them, or when they ask you questions during teamwork, of course, we always ask questions back, right? Like, well, why did you think that? Or why did you choose that answer? When they do most of the talking, you learn why they chose the right answer or why, or why they chose the wrong answer or why they chose the right answer. They might've chosen the right answer for the wrong reason, which is worse than choosing the wrong answer actually. So um, I've learned about misconceptions they have about various things that I never would have never realized, never occurred to me they were thinking about something in a certain way. So um, by having them do more talking, we can teach more effectively and they are learning more effectively. And then I just ended it with a selection of references that um, the information I have here is based on, but there's a ton of literature on the effectiveness of team-based and problem-based learning. So I think I, it, address the questions or concerns you guys had did we have i guess four more minutes does anybody else have anything they wanted to ask more about or i do have some things i want to share because i got to see elizabeth do this in person and watch with this large class this large class is at eight o'clock in the morning so uh, she has figured out that you know students are going to come late they come late at any hour but especially at eight o'clock she gives them a different test for eight o'clock. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Um, so yeah, it's actually like content wise, it's the same, but I have a late penalty on it. So they, the problem is, yeah, like Amy said, 8 a.m., people have a hard time getting there. And I would have, I'm not kidding you, for test days, 30 people walk in late. And I don't want them climbing over the people that because you, you saw my classroom, right? It's Sullivan 101. And it's not fair to have them climbing over the people that are working on their tests. So I said, if you show up late, you have to take a late penalty. And I write it on the top of the paper ahead of time. So any papers that get given out automatically have the late penalty written on it. And they have to come to the tardy table at the front of the room. And what do you guys think the most common reason for being late is, or most common excuse for being late at 8 a.m.? Traffic. 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 And after I impose the late penalty, I fix the traffic in Greensboro because I would only have one or two late. Although the day you were there, Amy, it was crazy. There were a bunch of them late. Maybe they want to make their, they knew we were filming and wanted their hair to look good, but usually I only have a couple that are late. But yeah, that solved that problem of them being tardy. And then I've tell, I tell them, you know, if you have a legitimate reason, we can argue about it afterwards and I'll take the late penalty off if you have a good reason. So, I mean, and sometimes they do. There's all kinds of issues that people have that make them late. We've also been um, interviewing students using this model and uh, TAs. Uh, the the students who help walk around and help talk to students in the groups because she can't hit all the groups because it's being in the classroom and seeing all those hands go up she she definitely needs those TAs to help her answer those questions and the students were like this really kind of changed the game for me about helping me apply the information so it wasn't just memorizing that they could actually kind of go deeper into the material so it really changed that they really loved that model they were gushing about how well this works and I asked the TAs, like, when students call you over, what do they ask you? Are they trying to get the right answer out of you so they get it right? And they're like, no, most of the time they're asking about process. They're, they want to share their process out loud of, here's all the things that I did. Are we on the right track? 
and they were like, ah, oh, here's the mistake in your process, or you're missing, or you, you miss a step in between here and here. So I thought, that, I thought that was interesting that students weren't asking the right, give me the question, they were trying to speak out their process, and that is so important. Yeah. All right, I guess we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs>